Hi there, everyone. Welcome to The Daily Gardener. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's April 30th. I realize you're very excited to get going in your own garden, but don't forget to schedule some time this spring to visit other gardens. The gardens of friends, neighbors, or public gardens can provide you with inspiration and teach you something new, even when you didn't think you'd have anything to learn. By the way, this entire week is Historic Garden Week at Monticello in Virginia. And if you visit today, April 30th, you can learn more about their flower and vegetable gardens. Here is today's brevities. It's National Raisin Day. California is the biggest supplier of the sun-dried grapes, and the California Associated Raisin Company, known as SunMade, was created with the idea for an ingenious co-op, and the credit for this novel approach went to vineyardist Henry H. Welsh. Welsh came up with the idea for a three-year grower contract, binding the raisin grower to deliver all of his crop for a guaranteed price. Naturally low in fat, raisins contain healthy nutrients unless you're eating the yogurt or chocolate-covered raisins. In their natural state, they're good for humans, but not for dogs. Small quantities of grapes and raisins can cause renal failure in dogs. On this day in 1789, Washington was sworn in as the first president of the United States. A gardening president, George Washington oversaw all aspects of the land at Mount Vernon. Washington had a personal copy of Batty Langley's New Principles of Gardening. Inspired by the 18th century author, Washington adopted a less formal, more naturalistic style for his gardens, and he supervised a complete and total redesign of his Mount Vernon. On this day in 1873, biologist William Starling Sullivan died. In 1840, he published his Flora, and then he started to hone in on his true calling, mosses. Bryology is the study of mosses. The root bryos is a Greek verb meaning to swell. It's the etymology of the word embryo. Bryology will be easier to remember if you think of the ability of moss to swell as it takes on water. As a distinguished bryologist, mosses suited Sullivan's strengths, requiring patience and close observation and discrimination. In 1873, Sullivan contracted pneumonia, ironically an illness where your lungs fill or swell with fluid, and he died on April 30th, 1873. During the last four decades of his life, Sullivan exchanged letters with Asa Gray, his no wonder then that he left his herbarium of some 18,000 moss specimens to Gray's beloved Harvard University. On this day in 1943, the noted botanist who became president of the Huguenot College in South Africa, Bertha Stoneman, died. The Stoneman family had many notable achievements. Her aunt Kate was the first woman admitted to the New York State Bar, and her uncle George Stoneman was a general in the American Civil War, and he became the 15th governor of California. Bertha Stoneman completed her undergraduate and doctorate degrees in botany at Cornell. She jumped at the chance to lead the botany department at Huguenot College. When talking to Americans during home visits, Stoneman praised South African plant life, saying, South Africa provides 42 species of asparagus. Why should it not be cultivated as a vegetable? There are fine citrus, avocado, pears, figs, pawpaws, you need not seek employment. Employ yourself. Come soon, and you will be warmly and courteously welcomed. On this day, it's the birthday of botanist and USDA agronomist Samuel Mills Tracy, born in 1847. Tracy is perhaps best known for his two works, Flora of Missouri and The Flora of the Southern United States. Today, the Tracy Herbarium hosts the largest grass collection in Texas. 
In unearthed words, on this day in 1827, Scottish botanist David Douglas took a break from collecting for the Royal Botanic Institution of Glasgow. He was lagging behind the others in his party as he was making his way through the Athabasca Pass. Here's what he recorded in his journal. After breakfast at one o'clock, I became desirous of ascending one of the peaks, and accordingly I set out alone on snowshoes. The ascent took me five hours. This peak, the highest yet known in the northern continent of America, I feel a sincere pleasure in naming Mount Brown in honor of Robert Brown, the illustrious botanist. A little to the southward is one nearly of the same height. This I named Mount Hooker after his sponsor, William Hooker. Douglas's trip was a success. He collected over 200 new plants. Douglas was the first Englishman to bring back cones of the sugar pine, the lodgepole pine, the ponderosa, and of course the Douglas fir. Within a year of his return, they would all be growing in English gardens and on Scottish estates. And here's a special note. The Douglas fir is not a true fir, which is why it is always spelled with a hyphen. Anytime you see a hyphen in the common name, you know it's not a true member of the genus. For today's book recommendation, I'm pleased to feature Mastering the Art of Vegetable Gardening, Rare Varieties, Unusual Options, Plant Lore, and Guidance by Matt Mattis. Matt offers a wealth of new and exciting opportunities alongside beautiful photography, lore, insight, and humor that can only come from someone who has grown each vegetable himself and truly loves gardening. For today's garden chore, diversify your tulip plantings for next spring. If you garden south of Zone 7, try Tulip Turkestanica. I'm guessing you'll find a sudden soft spot for this early blooming, sweet-faced little tulip. It's not your typical tulip. This is a species tulip. Species tulips are the most perennial of all tulips. They're petite, long-lived beauties. They're ideal for rock gardens or at the front of borders. And like daffodils, they look amazing planted right in the grass. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. When I was researching Mount Vernon, I was struck by Washington's intentions and methods. Of his four gardens, Washington referred often to his favorite, the botanical garden. He called it the little garden by the salt house, or rather fondly, his little garden. Washington used the botanical garden as his trial garden, testing alfalfa and oats, which he happily surmised correctly would increase the productivity of his fields. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced weekdays in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. You can find complete show notes over at thedailygardener.org. And be sure to share the show with your garden friends. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest, and of course, Facebook. While you're over at Facebook, don't forget to join The Daily Gardener community. Just search for these three words, Daily Gardener Community. The group will pop right up and then request to join. Finally, I want to thank my team at Podfly Productions, where my fabulous editor is Eric Begay. Have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.